So this is the edition two. We had uh, last month the edition one. We had about 140 participants. I think it was pretty successful. Um, I'm sure this will be uh, even better this time. Okay. So I will start slowly. The, f the first slides are, let's say, uh, more general about the company. Then uh, let's say uh, we have additional minutes to go deeply into this uh, topic. So search Arista selection. We will try to give you the uh, basics, the fundamentals, how to dimension a search Arista to fit your system parameters. So of course, uh, this is not a, a webinar uh, for, uh, let's say, a deep specialists, for experts. We try to cover all the different uh, topics, let's say, electrical ratings, mechanical ratings, and we need to be general, we need to summarize. And um, so to make sure it fits everybody's expectation. Okay, so here's the agenda. Uh, the presentation, this webinar will be divided in two parts. Uh, I will take care of the first part, and then my colleague Philippe Raschke will uh, take care of the second part. So we could say that the first part is mainly related to electrical dimensioning, let's say, energy electrical, and the second part is mainly mechanical relation to the design and pollution, seismic, and mechanical performance. And I hope this time we will be, let's say, a little bit more efficient that we have time at the end to answer the questions in live. Um, last time it was pretty difficult, but we will do our best. So a brief introduction of the, uh, of the company. Uh, probably some of you are not very familiar. Uh, just, a, let's say, some, some highlights. Uh, as you know, we belong to uh, this international Japanese group, Maidensha, who is uh, uh, proud to have invented the MOV technology in the 70s and then developed the, uh, say, one of the first uh, silicon housing design for surge arresters. And in 2015, they made the acquisition of Tridelta Überspannung Ableiter here in Germany. So we are located in Hermsdorf, Germany, where we are located. Uh, this, this, let's say, this factory, this building has a very long history here in the region with the uh, first production of porcelain insulators in 1876. And then in the 60s, the first production of uh, surge arresters. So at the beginning, it was, uh, let's say, an old technology, silicon carbide. And then came at the end of the 80s, the first production of metal oxide surge arresters. So we are pretty, uh, proud to share this, let's say, this uh, historical passion for, for surge arresters. Um, a brief overview of the, of the portfolio. Um, the, this webinar today is mainly uh, related to the dimensioning of high voltage arresters, which is also, let's say, the, 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 the core, the, the core uh, competence of uh, Tridelta Maiden Shah. When you look at the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the search arrester design, so uh, we have, let's say, a complete portfolio for porcelain, very compact por porcelain search arresters, the cage design polymer. I will go a little bit into the details afterwards, just to show you the uh, the overview, um, because this, let's say, it has its importance when it comes to dimensioning and design to look at the, uh, the type or the, they say the housing type. So SB series for porcelain, SBKC series for cage design polymer and SBKT series for holocore poly polymer. Um, then we have, uh, let's say uh, an extensive portfolio that we are um, dev developing in the last years um, we have this new uh, series for uh, initially developed for medium voltage, this uh, winding filament SBKW, uh, which is let's say a kind of uh, innovation in terms of uh, manufacturing process design. And this can be used also for station class and, uh, and line search arresters. Um, then we have uh, 
monitoring solution, let's say advanced monitoring solution. So we'll not talk uh, about this today, but uh, this is probably the next, uh, the next topic of the, of the next webinar, uh, because this is, let's say, quite important to, let's say, to be able to detect uh, potential risky cell gyristors. And uh, it's actually challenging. So uh, Tridelta has a solution called Smart Count to be able to detect uh, zinc oxide blocks, degradation, or moisture ingress, or housing contamination, which is, uh, let's say, also uh, uh, connected, I mean, giving you, giving you the possibility to, to have access uh, through a, a cloud platform and monitor uh, the arrest in a modern way. Uh, and then comes special application um, we are um, supplying such arrestor components to different OEMs, to different factories and integrators, which is also a special topic. If you have uh, questions, feel free to, to, to ask us about this. Okay, so now we go into the, so maybe we want to make a, before I forgot, um, we would like to, let's say, understand a little bit um, what's your main interest for this um, webinar. Let's say which topic is important for you. So we have prepared a small, uh, uh, small questions, um, a poll. So Caroline, you can uh, start. So there will be a window that you should see a window and you should be able to answer. I think it's a uh, multiple choice. Um, so you can tell us what what is important for you, and maybe Philippe and myself we will let's say adapt our um, our speech and uh, maybe spend more time on specific topics. So we will give you additional few seconds to select. There might be, uh, let's say, people in the audience from, let's say, different backgrounds and different industries. Therefore, you might be interested in the voltage ratings more than in the energy ratings or short circuit performance, which is also uh, an important part in when it comes to, to safety. And uh, also pollution performance. We had recently a lot of discussion about uh, salt folk and salinity and and utilities having flash over on the on the housing so this is also i think an important topic so i think we are good you can uh, close the the poll and this display the results maybe okay well so it's pretty um let's say uh, there is a uh, interest from uh, different uh, different areas so let's say most important is the voltage ratings and the short circuit performance Okay, but let's say the results are, let's say 50, 50, 50. Okay, thank you, Caroline. So um, we will jump into the technical part. Um, as you know, the, the key component of the surge arrestor is the zinc oxide varistor. And uh, as arrestor manufacturers, we see also ourselves as uh, artists of uh, ZNO staking because we are playing with the blocks, with the number of blocks, with the type of blocks, with the diameter of the blocks. And uh, this is actually the challenge. And we'll try to, to let's say, to dive a little bit deeper on this, on this topic right now with the first with the voltage ratings. So this is the core component of the arrester and they have this unique nonlinear characteristic. They divert the energy to the ground in microseconds and they are, let's say, uh, now since the 80s, the uh, zinc oxide varistors are, let's say, a proven technology uh, to handle over voltages. So this uh, webinar will cover uh, because we have to make it simple. You know, we can cover, we cannot cover all application and uh, all types. So we will not talk about HVDC. We will not talk about externally gapped. We will try to focus on main applications, which are gapless types, um, 
But of course, if you have any questions related to other application, feel free to ask us. Um, the typical application for search arresters, gap list types, is of course the protection of power transformers, those, let's say, expensive uh, equipment or the main assets of a substation. And the primary windings are normally, let's say, universally protected uh, since the transformer is their highest value in the substation. And also because the windings are, have the lowest uh, western voltage. And therefore, it's very common, as you can see on this picture, to have the surge arresters installed near the transformer. And uh, the, let's say the nearest, the better is the protection. So also both primary and secondary bushings are protected by default using the same arresters. And uh, from time to time, you can see also uh, uh, surge arresters on the neutral point. Then comes another typical application, um, also I would say very, very common, but not uh, systematic, which is the protection of uh, uh, sorry, underground cables at transition points. Uh, so for such application, the, pro the protection is dedicated to the cable since the, the cable itself is, uh, is, not a, it's, is not a self restoring insulation and uh, nobody wants, uh, let's say, potential damages on the cable itself. You don't want, um, let's say, insulation breakdown on the, uh, on the cable uh, uh, coating, insulating material, uh, which could lead to very expensive uh, maintenance tasks and the intervention to uh, replace a cable. Uh, so this is called, uh, yeah, this is, that's why it's called a transition point, which is a sensitive area that, that is normally protected with uh, search arresters. And as you can see on the picture also, we, uh, Tridelta has developed um, a kind of um, three-in-one solution, so integrated search arrester on the cable termination to simplify uh, mounting installation. So the picture that you see on the right is the installation in the harsh winter of Canada. Uh, then another typical application, which is, I would say, growing in the last years, in the last decades, which is the protection of uh, transmission lines. So the idea here is not to protect valuable assets, is not to protect uh, a sensitive point, like a, a, cable, a transition point between cable and overhead line, but it's really to address the topic of lightning performance. So to reduce the number of outages, uh, which are due to lightning. So without going into the details, um, there are, there are different, uh, different application. This is where you find often the externally gap solution but it's, uh, let's say, also uh, still very common to use the non-gap uh, application for, the, uh, for this topic. So most of the time, the line is shielded. Most of the time, uh, there is, let's say, uh, um, a special care which is applied during the, uh, uh, erect, uh, during the tower erection to make sure we achieve a good grounding. But nevertheless, this is not enough in some countries, in some region, we still see um, um, say special transmission line that are really affected by lightning. And in general, lightning is the most, um, let's say, uh, the main cause of uh, outages. So before going into the, let's say, voltage, ra voltage rating selection, um, I would like to give a, let's say, um, um, a basic introduction of the surge arrester design because it's quite important uh, uh, to look at the design. There are countries which are using porcelain, countries which are using silicon. And you can see here on the slide, um, uh, let's say this uh, significant improvement that was achieved over the last uh, 30 years in terms of arrester design. And uh, for example, for 400 kV application, you see in the 90s, um, a surge arrester was about 750 kilos. Today with uh, composite material, we can achieve 100 kilos with even better performance because there have been also improvement in the manufacturing of metal oxide varistors. 
And uh, yeah, and today it's very common, more and more utilities are going into silicon. And uh, you can see on the, on the right side, this uh, cage design, which offers, let's say, uh, uh, it's a cost advantage, but also a state of the art manufacturing process and uh, let's say some technical features that I'm showing on the on the slides here on the next one. You can see some, uh, let's say, uh, details about this uh, cage design. So there, <laughs> it's, uh, it's important to make a distinction between this design and the other two hollow core where the silicon is directly molded onto the active part. So you don't have any air, any gap inside. And by achieving a, a good burning performance, it's also it's a, a, key, uh, a key design to prevent moisture ingress. Um, only limitation is the, mechan me the mechanical strength. So we can go up to 420 kV system, but it will depend on the uh, cantilever strength that you require for the, for the substation. It also offers uh, outstanding short circuit capabilities uh, because the, let's say, the uh, energy of the arc in case of short circuit will, will easily go through the silicon rubber. And of course, the silicon rubber is, uh, let's say, well known for its uh, excellent pollution performance, especially the hydrophobicity uh, that helps to reduce uh, tracking on er and erosion and prevent uh, a flashover and the insulator. So in comparison, you have those, uh, let's say also conventional uh, porcelain and uh, high strength uh, polymer, so holocore design. Um, so those designs have been introduced in the market uh, earlier before the cage design. And in general, those designs also more expensive, but there might be a specific reason why you use them in general. So typically countries that are using porcelain, they are reluctant to use silicon for some specific reason because they had probably a bad experience in the past. It might be due to the mechanical strength. Um, the polymer holocore design is, um, it's mainly used um, because in comparison to the other design, it's, uh, let's say one of the let's say most costly design. Um, it's normally used if you have special short circuit requirement or very specific mechanical strength. For example, if you want to use it as a, as a support function, uh, if you want to combine surge arrester and insulators together, but also for special seismic application. So first it's, it's important to look at the design and then we can go into the, the next step. Uh, so for gapless surge arresters, um, we have uh, the IC standards 699-4 for, for, uh, for the design and the testing of the, of the surge arrester, the gapless surge arresters and the dash five, which is more, uh, let's say a guidance to, uh, to support you for the application. And for, let's say for North America, for the IEEE standards, and there was recently, uh, let's say an update in July, 2020. Uh, there is a new IC, uh, sorry, IEEE C62.11. So this is, let's say, um, it's, let's say it's not completely harmonized because this is quite difficult, but at least the main the main parts, especially the energy ratings has been harmonized. So this is, uh, let's say the important documents if you want to go further. And many information that we will discuss today, that we will describe today, or you can find all the details and uh, all, let's say the, the Bible or those documents. So for the um, voltage ratings, we need to talk about insulation coordination. As you know, the surge arresters and the surge arresters are used to limit the transient of a voltage. So typically you have, uh, there is a risk that you exceed the recent voltage of your equipment. Uh, 
the lighting impulses and the switching impulses of let's say those typical uh, transient over voltage uh, that you can see here on the diagram having different uh, duration, different wave shape. And the idea is uh, by installing line arresters to reduce and to limit the over voltage to prevent um, a voltage breakdown of the uh, withstand voltage of the equipment. So here you see an example of it's a good application. And uh, I will show you afterwards an example of uh, let's say a bad application to make sure everybody, uh, let's say, understand the, the, the concept of the voltage rating selection. So let's take an example of a 420 kV system with a, let's say, a typical uh, BIL, so basic installation level for, let's say, North America, but also lightning impulse Western level for, let's say, the, the rest of the world, which is more common. So 1,420 kV system. So we need to make sure that we have enough safety ma margin between the equipment we want to protect and the protection level of the arrester. And uh, there is no, no, a minimum safety margin of 40% to be achieved. So this, this helps to understand the importance of the residual voltage, which is the key rating of the arrester, also called the discharge voltage in the US. This protection level or residual voltage are really the key. The, the, lo the lower is the voltage, the better is your protection. And the better will be this, this, this safety margin. Um, we, we are not going to cover this uh, installation Western voltage topic. It was the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the main topic of the first uh, session one of the, uh, the first uh, webinar. Uh, but basically, uh, to summarize quickly, the arrestor protect themselves. Uh, so you always need to refer to the residual voltage. And I highly recommend you to visit our YouTube channel and you can listen to this uh, arrestor knowledge session one, which is covering the, the insulation level. So Western voltages, altitude correction, clearance calculation. This is quite important uh, because the arrestor protect not only the equipment, but also themselves. And you have the possibility to use um, lower uh, Western voltages for the arrestor itself, but also you, you don't have to oversize them when you, need, when you install them at very high altitude. And if needed, you can also reduce the clearances on, uh, let's say, on a specific, uh, for a specific application. For example, recently we had a, a client who, who has not, during the design stage of the substation, they have not considered the clearance uh, between the grading rings of the arrester. So they have only considered the clearance from the conductors. So, so the, during the execution of the project, they realize, oh, um, we have a, a clearance viola violation. And actually, if you do a proper uh, 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 clearance calculation with the protection level of the arrester, you can solve the problem, let's say, easily. So, if you uh, look at the data sheet of the search arrestor, you can see typical values and they are very specific to search arrestors. Um, the rated voltage, it's very specific. It's uh, different than uh, the rated voltage of the system. It's, uh, it represents mainly the temporary over voltage for 10 seconds. I will give more details afterwards. The continuous operating voltage, UC, for IC or MCOV for IEEE is the maximum continuous operating voltage that the surge arrester uh, can withstand um, as a power frequency voltage over its service life. Then you have TOV values, you have the nominal dis discharge current, which is used for classification. This nominal dis 
discharge current is not directly related to the perf to the performance or the energy ratings, but mainly for the for the classification according to the standards. Then you have uh, the protection level. As I said, this is the key rating for 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 the design for the protection. Uh, you have a residual voltage for according to lightning switching and uh, step front impulses. And then comes the energy ratings. Uh, QRS and uh, WTH. I will also provide more details afterwards. So these are the main, if you have to, let's say, to, um, to dimension the active part of the surge arresters, this is the most important uh, ratings. Okay, so let's start with a basic example of, uh, of a system uh, Of the, uh, I'm trying to speed up a little bit to make sure Philip has enough time afterwards. Um, so, as you can see here, is a, it's a, just an example for a 420 kV system, a solidly grounded neutral configuration uh, with a typical uh, fault factor of uh, 1.4. So, as you know, the surge arrestor is uh, directly connected from uh, phase to ground. So this neutral grounding configuration is quite important. Yeah? We are just taking an example here for let's say a solidly grounded uh, type, but if you have uh, let's say uh, insulated uh, neutral point or through an impedance, you will you have in general a higher uh, TOV. Therefore, you need uh, to uh, let's say apply a different calculation that will give you higher voltage ratings. So here, here for this uh, say standard calculation, so we have a maximum phase to ground voltage of 420 kV. So we take the maximum phase to ground voltage, 242 kV. We need to apply a safety margin um, um, of 5% to compensate uh, disturbances and harmonics that will give us um, a UC or MCOV of minimum 255 kV. So this is the maximum continuous operating voltage that the surge arrestor can withstand over its service life. Okay, then once you have defined the uh, required MCOV, we need to define the uh, rated voltage, UR, also called the uh, duty cycle voltage for IEEE. So there are two methods. There is let's say, a very simple way to calculate, um, let's say the rated voltage once you have your MCOV uh, or UC. There is, um, because as I said before, this rated voltage represents the TOV. So the capability to withstand a temporary over voltage for 10 seconds. And so for uh, any kind of MOV, uh, zinc oxide varistor, the ratio between UC and UR is pretty fixed. So most of the manufacturers, they are using this 25%, this ratio of 125 to define the, uh, the, the rate of voltage. So let's say this is, this is pretty safe uh, to, use, to use this method, but if we want to understand why, we need to, let's say, to look a little bit deeper into the TOV curve. Um, you can see this uh, power frequency voltage uh, time characteristic that helps us uh, to define the, uh, let's say, the, the rated voltage in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. So once you have defined the minimum rated voltage, um, it's also very common to look at the, uh, uh, stan standard ratings that you can find in the in the in the IC or IEEE uh, standards for the uh, in the guides and the uh, uh, selection recommendation. Uh, so for this voltage level, we have typical values of 336 and 360 kV. So then, once you have defined the rated voltage, um, the best way is to 
well, it depends, yeah? but I try to get a, a, a simple approach by looking at the, a typical uh, Arista catalog. So um, I took this, uh, this catalog for SH classification, which is pretty common. Of course, there are further, let's say, system studies uh, which are required to define the energy ratings, um, which is mainly dependent on your uh, um, system, on, on, on your specific system. So you can see here for each voltage uh, rating, for each rated voltage, you have um, a specific uh, protection level at 20 kA. So 20 kA is the nominal discharge current for this classification. And you can see that um, depending on the TOV requirements, so if you don't have any specific TOV requirements, it will make more sense to use 336 because you have a better protection level. So the safety margin between this protection level and the withstand voltage of the equipment that you want to protect will be higher. But it's also very common to see 360 kV for, for 420 kV system. And in that case, you will have to select this. And of course, um, the, protect, the safety margin will be high enough. And uh, for some reason, and it's quite common, sometimes we, uh, let's say, received a specification from utilities where the TOV requirements do not match with the rated voltage. And this is quite important, and this is what I want to show here. If you have, for some reason, if you have very high TOV requirements, that leads to a selection of 396 kV, you will have such a rated, such a residual voltage at 20 k, a protection level of 1026 kV. And um, if you show, sorry, <laughs> I'll jump back. If you look at this um, insulation coordination, again, if you have such, um, um, let's say high uh, protection level of 1026 kV, you will not achieve this safety margin with the equipment you want to protect. So this is important to find a, a balance between the protection level, you always want to have the lowest residual voltage, but you need to make sure that the surge arrester will withstand the TOV on your system. And of course, the best way to, to summarize and to understand this is to, to look at this typical voltage current characteristic. So you will all, always have the same shape for the, let's say, for the varistors which have this nonlinear characteristic. Um, we need to split this uh, diagram in two parts. Um, on the left side, on the bottom left in this area, we are, let's say, in the operating, uh, operative area where you have the uh, UC or MCOV. When you have a temporary of a voltage, the point will go up in this area for a few seconds and then comes back to the operating point even below actually this area under nominal, normal operation. And then in case of lightning or switching of a voltage, the surge arrester will, will be able to divert the energy to the ground and will say protect the equipment with its res residual voltage. And the big challenge when you manufacture MOV, zinc oxide varistors, you want to have a good ratio between the protection level, the, the residual voltage, and the TOV capability. So it's always the big challenge. Okay, now I jump, I think the time is, is good. Um, I will find, let's say, uh, conclude um, with the energy ratings. So there are two energy ratings uh, which are important. Uh, one is the uh, repetitive charge transfer, the QRS, which let's say has to do with lighting charges, surges, which is um, the, the process is let's say quite specific. It's more like a, um, a, st a statical um, approach to um, let's say to guarantee uh, the, me the mechanical integrity of the blocks after injection of uh, 
several groups of lightning impulses. In comparison, um, you have the, the thermal energy, which is more related to the switching, which is actually uh, um, the, the dimensioning of, the, of, this, uh, of, the, of this rating is related to the cumulative energy during a line switching. Um, and uh, you, you want to make sure that the, um, let's say you want to, the, 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 the surge arrestor is stable. So you will inject the energy, but afterwards you will apply uh, a TOV, actually the rated voltage for 10 seconds, and then the uh, MCOV for 30 minutes. And you want to make sure that the, 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 the thermal behavior is good, that you will, that the surge arrestor will recover. And this is, let's say, two, uh, two different approaches to, uh, to calculate energy ratings. At the end, um, there is, a, of course, a relation between the energy performance and uh, the diameter of the blocks. So if you have uh, um, additional questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to, uh, to send it in the Q&A section. I will now uh, hand over to Philip to make sure he will cover also this the next part, very, also very interesting. So, so thanks for your time and see you in a few minutes. Hello, everybody. Part two of the webinar. It's um, my pleasure to start with a very nice, very interesting topic of our business. It's the short circuit capability of the search arrestor. And uh, let's start like this because um, Florent has luckily covered the topic of the energy handling capability of the search arrestor and um, a question we have to ask ourselves uh, is what happens when the energy capability of the search arrestor is um, exceeded, like uh, the search arrestor has not um, been specifically designed for this application. Um, there are switching impulses which are of higher energy than what has been selected before. Um, or if there is the case that uh, zinc oxide varistors of the search arrestor um, underlie a degradation, um, aging, or humidity has ingressed into the housing of the search arrestor. And all of those cases will certainly lead to a thermal runaway of the search arrestor. So it gets hotter and hotter. The uh, power dissipation gets more and more. And this is like a doom cycle where the search arrestor um, in the end will explode or um, be affected by an inner flash over. So under these harsh circumstances, we have to make sure as a manufacturer that our search arrestors are able to uh, uh, fail in that case that, uh, and, in, and in a way where the destruction is not violent. So like we say, search arrests uh, must fail in safe mode. In the case when a search arrest is failing, which is, uh, I would say, a very seldom case, um, you don't have, uh, have this very often, but when it happens, you have to make sure that, ha that it happens in, uh, in safe mode, as I said. And um, we have to specify um, specific um, pass criteria for tests for so-called short circuit tests and uh, therefore we have uh, two, two values, two ratings. One of it is the amplitude, 
in kiloamps, and the other is the, uh, the the time, the duration of the short circuit current. And mainly the amplitude is given by the uh, maximum short circuit capability of the grid. It's not the, the maximum, but it's uh, it's almost the size. And uh, the time where this short circuit current um, occurs is only a short time, uh, like we uh, show here in the slides, of mi milliseconds, where um, the, uh, the security relay uh, reacts uh, to, to clear the fault, typically within 0 0.2 seconds or latest after one second. And that's why we have um, a amplitude in our standard uh, 99-4, which is rated short circuit current. So that's the highest short circuit current the search arrestor have to withstand. We have a reduced value and a low short circuit current value. And this is a table copied from the standard where you see those three, um, uh, let's say current ratings. One, uh, the, the left one is the rated short circuit current for 0 0.2 seconds. And the second one are typically two different currents, uh, mostly half of the rated short circuit current. And again, half of that for 0 0.2 seconds. And then uh, the low short circuit current with one second of duration. Now let's pick one of those uh, currents here. If you have a search arrestor class with a nominal discharge current of 20 or 10 kA, typical rated short circuit current is 63 kA. And if the search arrestor has to withstand this rated short circuit current, you have to test 63 kA, but you also have to test reduced short circuit current 25 and 12 kA with 0 0.2 seconds duration and additionally a low short circuit current of uh, around 600 amps with one second duration. All of those short circuit, rated short circuit currents uh, below that uh, specific 63 kA are covered by this test. So what we typically do is select one row, test the whole row, 63, 25, 12, and 600, and then all the other currents are covered. And uh, I've included this slide to show a little bit the magic behind uh, this short circuit and how we withstand it. So the theory is that when uh, a search arrest fails, it gets hotter and so on. There, uh, there is an internal arc inside the search arrestor. The uh, air inside the search arrestor or the material of the search arrestor is getting hotter, it's expanding, and the pressure has to come out of the housing of the search arrestor, what we call pressure relief. And therefore, we, um, we design the search arrestors with specific pressure relief devices, like on the left side, our SBKT design. It has a kind of membrane and um, this, this plate, which is, um, which is playing a big role to uh, put the outcoming ionized gas in the right direction. And also second picture of the SP0 uh, that shows the, this typical uh, shovel shaped uh, pressure relief device where hot gas, the ionized gas is coming out and providing a conductive path through the air so current can flow through air and not through the search arrestor itself. And then we have the SBK C design where, where the strength of the of the design is the the pressure relief of the the, the silicone itself. Silicone is very soft, so pressure can really release, release very easy for this design. And then fourth one on the right side is the SPKW, which uh, also has a kind of inherent pressure relief by this uh, cross wrap open cross wrap pattern. That's the magic behind. That's the design secret. And uh, now some of you really want to see a short circuit current and so we don't want to hide this um, very nice footage of a 80 kA short circuit current test on our SPKT2 search arrestor. And hopefully the video will work. Well, it looks good, uh, enjoy. 
Um, what you see here is uh, pressure releasing outside of the uh, SPKT housing and a conductive path is created through the air by ionizing the air. So the whole short circuit current in the moment it um, comes out of the pressure relief device flows through the air and this is kind of protecting the surge arrestor itself. So the surge arrestor stays mechanically intact and uh, it does not break and does not violently shatter or um, some fragments are flying around and providing damage to equipment or life which is surrounding the surge arrestor. That's why we have to do the test. And this is impressive as you have seen. Okay. I have to, uh, to close the video again. Uh, here we go. One other topic, and I think we will uh, hold it short, is weather resistance of such arrestors, especially uh, contamination performance. I've called it contamination performance because um, such arrestors are affected by different environmental conditions like humidity, rain, UV light, salt fog, dust, sand, ice, snow, and also industrial and organic pollutions, which finally leads to uh, conductive surfaces of the arrestor housings, and which can also provide damage by tracking and erosion and external flash over. So this is a problem we have to face in the search arrestor design and we have to also to consider in search arrestor selection. And uh, the, the main rating, which is important for pollution, um, uh, pollution performance when it comes to search arrestor selection is the creepage distance of the search arrestor. A sufficient creepage distance allows high insulation resistance of the search arrestor housings surface by increasing the path between face to ground and reduce the conductivity. This is very clear. So the longer the way from uh, voltage to ground is, the, the harder it is for the current to flow. Let's say it's simple like this. So that's why we provide a creepage distance and we can make it even better uh, by applying sheds to the housing, because here you see those uh, those sheds uh, on this uh, very old drawing I have, I have here, uh, and uh, you see that below those sheds there is an area where rain is not um, not coming, and uh, therefore those areas are kept clean and also dry. And uh, when those are areas are clean and dry, there's no possibility for current to flow below those sheds. So that's why we have those, uh, this shed profile. And uh, maybe one nice information about uh, this insulator we see here. It's a very old uh, insulator from our, uh, let's say, previous company in, in Hermsdorf, they have made insulators for the, the first high voltage applications and they made three sheds on it to provide creepage distance, one, two, three, and it has this kind of delta shape and that's why uh, the company was called Tree Delta. The IAC 6815 gives us a, a standardized creepage distance ratio millimeter per kV it's called unified specific creepage distance. And there are different classes for several pollution areas, very light pollution area, like uh, dry without any uh, humidity, salt fog, and everything I've counted in, those, in, the, in the slide before. And very heavy pollution, I would estimate as coastal area with uh, the influence of salt fog and uh, also pollution fr coming from from the air or for, from, from in industry or nature. So for those pollution areas, we have different classes and the classes, uh, the, uh, the, the, the specific creepage distances depend on those classes. It starts with 25 millimeter per kV, which is the lowest standardized class. And uh, this goes up to 50 millimeter per kV or even higher. So that means, um, there, there is the possibility we have a search arrestor with a certain rated voltage with uh, housing uh, with very 
um, low uh, creepage distance means also uh, low length. And uh, if we take the same search arrestor with the same rated voltage for, uh, let's say, class D heavy pollution area, we have to make the search arrestor longer. By uh, we have to increase the creepage distance, and therefore search arrestor has to be longer, and the shed profile has to be. Um, with uh, more cribbage distance in that case. One important point when it comes to weather, weather resistance is hydrophobicity. So um, porcelain housings are more and more replaced by silicon housings. And uh, this happens because uh, silicone is of course a uh, lightweight and uh, easy to, to uh, apply, but also it has one other benefit. Not everyone knows it's his hydrophobic effect, which um, allows the search arrestor to, uh, let's say, get rid of pollution and humidity on the surface before it starts being um, dangerous for the search arrestor. So pollution does not stick to the surface. Water remains as discrete droplets and uh, also the arrestor is capable to clean itself. You see it here, this one droplet, it's uh, just rushing down the, the shed. So there is uh, no humidity left on the, on the surface. And that's a very, uh, very great, um, very great thing for silicone house search arrestors because you can see a example here. We have made a test between um, porcelain house search arrestor and the silicone house search arrestor with the same ratings and same creepage distance. And you see the uh, uh, leakage current, no, not the leakage current, the surface current rising over the days of um, salt mist application. And for the silicone house search arrestor, the surface current is zero. It's only the, the pure natural zinc oxide leakage current you're seeing. So the hydrophobic effect of the silicone has a strong impact on the pollution performance and weather resistance of the search arrestor. And this is why the trend goes stronger to um, silicone house search arrestors. Bending strength is another very important parameter when it comes to selection of search arrestors. And um, the uh, the bending strength is defined because search arrestors in service are affected by mechanical loads. For example, when strong leads are used and the bending force of the lead is applied to the top of the search arrestor, the search arrestor has to take this uh, vertical load in this case. But also search arrestors, which are used without post insulators, which will carry the weight and also the movement of the incoming transmission line. And then we have wind loads on the search arrestor, but also electromechanical forces in short circuit condition, uh, which are coming from the conductor itself. And then we have finally the seismic vibration um, in, uh, in areas where earthquake is the topic. So all those, all those things uh, lead to uh, considerations in mechanical strength for the search arrestor. And we will, as, as a uh, um, manufacturer, we have to uh, offer different solutions with less or higher mechanical strength. For example, our porcelain house search arrestors, typically those are the search arrestors with the highest um, bending strength. Uh, here we test a braking load and, and you see in the picture how it is done. You have a hydraulic actuator and the porcelain has to break in a proper way when it's designed correctly. It's braking like you see here. And with this uh, braking load, we define a, a specific value, a standardized value, mean braking load. And this is our design parameter. And this is also the selection parameter for the porcelain house search arrestor. For, um, let's say, directly molded search arrestor, like our SPKC design or our SPKW, but also SPKT design, we have to provide 
other values different than the MBL, we have to provide the so-called SSL, specified short-term load, which is the maxim, maximum force or maximum bending load the surge arrestor can take for a short while. And uh, we tested, like you see it here in this, in this picture in the top right corner, uh, we have this kind of bending machine and also the, the accredited type, type test labs do it uh, in the same way. And um, you have to increase the force to uh, the, the specified short-term load. And you will hold this force for a couple of seconds and then you will release. And uh, afterwards, the surge, surge arrestor has to follow a, a couple of procedures to um, make sure that the, the quality stays the same. Let's say nothing, nothing happens, nothing is damaged. Uh, one further test we have to provide is the SSL test, specified long-term load. This is the, uh, the force, maximum force or bending moment applied to the surge arrestor, um, where the surge arrestor is capable to withstand uh, for its whole lifetime. So maximum continuous force on the surge arrestor. And we, we don't apply it uh, Statically, we apply it within 1,000 cycles uh, up and down. It's uh, bent up and down. And afterwards, we also have to do um, almost similar thing in uh, um, under different temperatures to make sure that this um, bending force also is applicable under uh, varying um, temperatures ambient temperatures. So here you see the same test, thermomechanical test in, um, in a climate chamber. And within this test, the uh, SLL value is specified. Typically, the SLL value is lower than the SSL value, of course. One thing I really want to mention here is that for this bending test, the silicone adhesion is uh, plays a big role uh, for the quality of the surge arrestor because after all those mechanical tests, we have to make sure that the silicone is still sticking to the inner materials, to uh, to the core, to the varistor, to um, ins insulating materials, to um, uh, rods or to fiber fiberglass material. And if this is not the case, um, within a boiling test, the water will ingress into the insulator, in, into the silicone insulator, and gather at specific points where no adhesion is prevailing. And in that case, of course, the surge arrestor is, um, can be affected by an internal flash over and uh, it will directly lead to a breakdown of the surge arrestor. So we have to make sure within the bending test that uh, the surge arrestor can withstand this, uh, this boiling and uh, what, no water is ingressing into the surge arrestor. And this is mainly covered by a very good silicone adhesion. Uh, we can also uh, check this uh, on, um, on a very easy way by a peeling test. And here you see our SPKC design uh, in the peeling test. We try to peel off the, the silicone together with a knife from the rods and from the MOV block. And it sh if it looks like this, it's uh, normally it's very good. So uh, you can peel off the silicone, but it will still stick to the rods. And here you see my colleague Florent trying very hard to do the peeling test, pull off test on an SPKW because we were having a bet then that he could just select one random search arrestor from our production and just do the pull off test and there will be no bonding of the silicone on the search arrestor. And I can tell you, he tried hard. You can see it on the pain of, on his face. So uh, I should have uh, bet some uh, some dollars on, on it. <laughs> One more interesting point is the seismic performance of the surge arrestor. Like I mentioned before in the bending test, also seismic forces uh, can play a role um, in, 
in uh, earthquake areas, so the search arrestor should withstand a certain ground acceleration and not only a search arrestor unit, also a complete search arrestor consisting of many units together with grading rings and all the accessories. So uh, typically uh, accelerations are defined by, uh, up to 1G, ground acceleration of course, and um, bending strength, length, weight, and the damping behavior of the surge arrestor play a key role. So it's never the same, um, same condition. Uh, each surge arrestor design behaves different in, uh, uh, under seismic conditions. Therefore, we have to make sure that uh, the, uh, the seismic performance is covered by a uh, sufficient method. Uh, here we show three typical methods, which are, let's say, common in the world. Uh, one is a conservative calculation, which is, I would say, um, with, with our experience, very close to the reality. Um, you can also do a, uh, a simulation by uh, FEM software, finite elements method software. And you can do the practical way. You can make an earthquake test like we see here, right? the right picture. Earthquake test means um, following procedure, you make a statis static pull test for the calibration of the force sensors. Then you make a snapback test to see the natural frequency of the surge arrestor. And then you take this natural frequency and um, you make a, a sweep uh, on, the, on the shaking table. And finally, you can uh, uh, you can do you can conduct the uh, seismic test with the uh, um, specified ground acceleration with a certain elevation factor. Let's call it safety factor to make sure the search arrestor not exactly fulfills uh, what is happening, but also more. Uh, so it it covers more than actually more than uh, the uh, the acceleration that is really um, taking place in this moment. And uh, depending on um, the, the case we have, we um, have a certain requirement of ground acceleration. So it depends on the area. Normally this comes from the customer. And this is how it looks like. Uh, this is in the, uh, in the test lab for seismic seismic tests. Works. And what you will see is the, the tests on the shaking table. So they will um, bring the, the shaking table in the natural frequency of the surge arrestor. Uh, let's skip a couple of seconds. Here it starts. They're ramping up right now. And when they hit the natural frequency, it will have the maximum deflection on top and it will have the highest acceleration on top and you see this this extreme movement of the search arrestor the search arrestor has to be capable of and of course it shall not break but afterwards it also shall withstand a couple of uh, electrical tests so uh, we may we have to make sure that it's electrically and mechanically still working But this is, as I told you, this is only one possibility to make sure that the search arrestor is capable to withstand a certain ground acceleration under earthquake condition. Okay, one, one more topic we are facing from time to time. And I think this was a question in our uh, webinar about uh, seismic, uh, not about seismic, about insulation uh, level of search arrestor. Okay, uh, my colleague Florent told me there's a question right now about this. So it's uh, great we covered this right now. Um, the typ typical question, uh, what's the maximum ground lead length? And also what's the maximum ground lead length if I use a search counter? So I have prepared a small example for you. We take a search arrestor with 10 kA nominal discharge current and we don't take the lightning discharge, we, we take 
uh, this the, this steeper value, one microsecond uh, rising slope. So the residual voltage is higher in that case. So this is the worst case we can we can calculate. And then we take the counter voltage drop, which is typically one kilovolt at 10 kA. Um, we calculate with a conductor length of 1.5 meters. And uh, typically you assume a inductivity of the conductor of one micro Henry per meter. So with that, we take the equation for the inductive voltage drop. We take the inductivity, the H is the, the length of the cable and the, 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 the rise of the, of the current and the duration of the rising slope. So um, calculating this, we have 15 kilovolt voltage drop across the ground lead of 1.5 meter plus surge counter. That means if you have 15 kilovolts additionally on the ground side of the surge arrestor, you would have to take this residual voltage of the surge arrestor here on top and also add 15 kilovolts voltage drop of the cable. And uh, then we don't uh, have 487 kilovolts anymore. We have uh, 503 kilovolts surge arrestor plus counter plus cable, 503. So you always have to consider inductive voltage drop when you calculate your protection level. And then, of course, we also have insulating bases here on the surge arrestor, and those have a certain insulation value. We have tested this specifically for our insulate, insulating basis. This is uh, normally more than 25 kilovolts for, um, for um, impulse um, tests, so an insulation test. And um, we can define the maximum cable length in that case with the maximum insulating base BIL. Uh, times the change of the rising slope, the change, the, the, the time duration of the rising slope and divided by the um, inductivity again and the change of the current. So change of the current is uh, 10 kA and uh, one microsecond. Microsecond is the time and one micro Henry is the in inductive voltage, uh, is, the, is the inductivity. And with that, we come to 2.5 meters maximum cable length in that case. So if you take a cable that is longer than 2.5 meters, there's a higher probability that the insulating base would flash over. I'm not saying it will, it will always happen, but the, the probability will be higher. So this is a classical calculation for um, the protective level of the surge arrestor depending on the cable length and also maximum cable length to make sure that the ins insulation of the insulating basis is still good. One more topic I would like to cover uh, here in this webinar is the question, what's the difference between a grading ring and a corona ring? Floor, do we also have a question about that right now? No. <laughs> anyway, um, this is a typical question and things are mixed up very often. So I would like to make this clear here on the left side. We have a typical search arrestor configuration, three units, a grading ring and a corona ring. And here on top, you see the corona ring. Um, its purpose is to prevent the arrestor terminals from emitting external partial discharge, which is interfering radio frequencies. And uh, in this picture I've chosen here, you can also see how partial discharge is, um, is emitted at this kind of sharp edge. We are, we are always make, trying to make sure that the edges of the of the top terminals of the search arrestor are round and smooth. So uh, RIV performance is good, but uh, on high voltage levels and big arrest sizes, uh, this is from time to time not sufficient. And then we have to apply a corona ring to reduce this 
um, this uh, radio interference, the, this external partial discharge. Therefore, we apply a corona ring. So typically, there is a question, can we, can we leave it away because um, we want to install a bus bar and something like that. So uh, normally, uh, we test this up to a certain voltage and on a certain voltage, the corona ring has to be applied um, on, on a certain uh, configuration. And um, normally, this, this is necessary to uh, provide the RIV performance. And then secondly, we have the grading ring. Different story. The grading ring is uh, its task is to uh, distribute the uh, the electrical field along the surge arrestor. Here you see a simulation of the electrical field of a two-unit surge arrestor. Um, on the left side, it's a kind of FEM simulation. And on the right side, you see a curve beginning on the bottom at MOV block number zero, going up to MOV block number 20. And uh, the voltage stress is on the x-axis. So voltage stress of one means continuous operating voltage. Everything is fine for the surge arrestor, but when it exceeds, uh, the continuous operating voltage, the, the, the specific MOV block is stressed higher than uh, the surge arrestor is uh, designed for. And therefore, typically, there is a, uh, a limit, which I show here as a red stripe in the diagram, which is, um, let's say, specific for each surge arrestor design. And you have to make sure that the voltage stress per MOV block is not higher than this value. And you see that the block number 20 here exceeds this limit. So what we have to do is to distribute the, the, the field along the surge arrestor differently. We have to make it more even. That's why we put a grading ring on top. And this is kind of... Um, aligning the, um, the uh, voltage distribution along the whole MOV stack. And now you see this orange curve appearing here right in the diagram. And it's much more even and closer to one. And one means uh, you are in a range where the surge arrestor is designed for what we call continuous operating voltage. Some surge arrestors are not needing a grading ring, typically for lower rated voltages, but at a certain level of rated voltage, we have to apply this grading ring and we do it case by case. So we make the simulation internally to make sure that all of our surge arrestors are safe and not operated uh, higher on, on a higher uh, operating point than what it should be designed for. Okay, coming to an end, I just want to mention that uh, all of the ratings we have shown here, we are testing by ourselves and we also test in external test labs and uh, those test labs are fully independent and we have test reports for um, almost all the designs we are offering. And um, when I say we can test it by ourselves, uh, then I mean that we also have our own high voltage test lab and maybe I can point this out at this point because uh, this is not very common that uh, manufacturers have uh, that possibilities like we have and this helps us in the design process but also gives us to, the possibility to provide factory acceptance tests for our customers um, which uh, happens very often actually and the, uh, the possibilities are big like we show in, in this uh, slide here. So thanks for listening and uh, I hope uh, the, the webinar was, uh, was interesting for you. It was surely a, a general, more or less general topic, not very specific, but uh, should help you to have a good overlook about all the topics we have to uh, face when we want to select a search arrestor for, uh, for a certain application. And um, we will be available for you for questions and answers. And also after, after the webinar, um, I would like to ask you to uh, 
to raise questions and to contact our team for your inquiries and we would be happy if you uh, go to a link to our LinkedIn page and uh, connect with our LinkedIn page and follow us on LinkedIn and also on YouTube, we will provide the video of this webinar on YouTube and we will also distribute the presentation for you. And uh, finally, we will answer all your questions in the next days and send around the answers. So thanks.